بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على دعهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين Dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the first episode of this new program, which is your show, From the Laws of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. The show is initially based upon one of the great encyclopedic works of one of the great ulama of the Shia, one of the greatest ulama to have appeared in history, namely Al Imam al Rahil. Sayyid Ayatollah al Uvma Muhammad Ibn Mahdi al Husseini al Shirazi Rahmatullah alayhi. May Allah have mercy upon his soul and may Allah continue to spread the teachings of Islam and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam through the great Muassasat and through, his, through the great foundations and institutions established under his name and through his prominent students. Before we begin analyzing the work of from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam, allow us to first analyze some brief details of the great life of this alim, this scholar who left behind a tremendous influence on the Muslim world, a scholar who perhaps undoubtedly within the 20th century was most probably an alim who contributed the most to the spread of Shiism within the largely non-Muslim world. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is when we look to the institutions of Shiism, the Shi'i institutions within non-Muslim parts of the world, for example, Africa, we find that many of these institutions were originally established under the name of Imam Muhammad al Husseini al Shirazi. We find that this is a great man who had a tremendous influence on the world, and therefore it would be a great injustice for me not to introduce this man to you all. Unfortunately, I feel humbled in having to do this task, for I am not someone who is worthy of introducing the great personality of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi. And indeed, I feel that it is not befitting of someone in my own shoes, with the amount of mistakes and sins I have in my own life, to present to you such a great man, one of the revered servants of Allah Azza wa and certainly one of the servants of Imam al Hussein. But because I am sitting in the blessed holy city of Karbala al muqaddasa and within this holy city, besides the precincts of the shrine, there is a special memory dedicated to the great personality of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi. I feel that I am obliged to some degree, due to the greatness of this sacred gathering, to introduce this man to you, so that you may not only be familiar with his work from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam, but indeed you would also become familiar with this great momentous scholar of Islamic philosophy, theology, jurisprudence, and indeed all disciplines of the Islamic sciences. And indeed you would be able to appreciate the context in which the work from the laws of Zahra was initially written. The great alim Muhammad ibn Mahdi al Husseini Shirazi was born in the year 1928 in Iraq in the holy city of Najaf, the very resting place of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and indeed the very seat of what has now become the main hausa of Iraq after the death of the great reviver of the Islamic sciences, Sheikh Ta'ifa, Sheikh Atusi, who of course is the writer of two of the four books, namely at tahvib al-Ahkam and Al-Istibsar. Although Muhammad al husseini al Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, he would primarily become known as a figure whose thought process, whose influence culturally 
over the entire Islamic world had spread initially from the holy city of Karbala al muqaddisah And that's why one finds that when they come to visit the holy city of Karbala, they often find when they visit the markets, when they visit the shops, when they visit even places which have no relation to Islamic studies, such as travel agents, they might indeed find the picture of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi placed on the walls of these places. Because indeed the people of Karbala have a great degree of respect for Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi. And it is with great unfortune that unfortunately this great alim who exerted much effort in spreading the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt was oppressed in his own time. What do I mean by oppressed? Unfortunately, it is not something we like to do to engage in discussion in discussions pertaining to the fitna, the trials and tribulations of the Muslim Ummah, and particularly amongst us the Shia. But one of the factors which influenced the oppression of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi within his own lifetime was the very fact that he was a scholar who had studied predominantly in the holy city of Karbala. One might be surprised, how could someone judge a scholar for the fact that he had studied in Karbala's Hausa. Surely the Hausa of Karbala, the very city in which Imam al Hussein, the Sayyid of the master of all the martyrs, is buried, is no doubt a place where knowledge can be sought, and no doubt a place where many of the great ulama before our time have been buried and had studied. People like Ibn Fahad al Hilli, who until today his Hausa remains intact. Yet one finds that unfortunately, due to the squabblings of some people who were jealous of Imam al-Shirazi, there was a particular slander campaign to try and belittle him, to try and demean him, purely based on the fact he had studied and brought his message from the holy city of Karbala. One finds such a thing surprising, for surely anyone who is familiar with the institution of the Hausa knows that the Hausa has never been confined to the holy city of Najaf. Indeed, one who studies the history of the Shia will know that at one point, the Hausa was an institution found in many different cities of the world, sometimes including cities that would surprise us today, such as Halep. Halep in Syria, one of the areas which is, of course, now under much scrutiny due to the current situation we live in, was at one point, a Shi'i center of learning. Likewise, we find that the Hausa at one point was based in Jabal al Amal in Lebanon, or even at another point when the situation under the Ottoman Empire had reached such a point in which Shias were being persecuted, the Hausa was eventually moved to Lucknow. Of course, existing in other places, but Lucknow in India at such a point became the main seat of the institutions of education for the Shi'i clerics. Back to the life of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi. Unfortunately, as I said, he was an individual who was slandered often by people who did not understand him, people who were jealous of him. Yet when we look towards this great thinker, we find that he was a thinker in numerous dimensions. Allow me to introduce some of his intellectual feats, some of his intellectual achievements. He was a man who successfully published 1,200 books according to that which we know and indeed there may indeed be some works which have not been published until now. In fact, his great set, the Encyclopedia of Fiqh, the Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence, don't be confused by the name when we say Encyclopedia of Jurisprudence, Imam Muhammad Shirazi was not concerned with restricting himself to the typical abwab, the typical chapters of jurisprudence which we concern ourselves with now, namely mu'amalat and ibadat, or transactions in addition to worship. Indeed, he did write about these things. But in addition to that, he wrote this magnificent encyclopedia covering the jurisprudence of everything, from the jurisprudence of hadith, as it's known as the book of fiqh, of the purified sunnah, in which he talks about how one engages with narrations to jurisprudence of dealing with the Quran. This great Mosua, this great encyclopedia, is 150 volumes, and unfortunately today one finds it an extremely rare encyclopedia to get hold of. 
but such an encyclopedia shows the great intellectual achievements reached by Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi. Should we confine him, however, to works of traditional ulama? Is he someone who merely focused upon usul, the science of deriving laws? Is he someone who merely focused on jurisprudence? Absolutely not. When we turn back to the works of Muhammad al-Shirazi, we find that he was what we would know what we would refer to in Arabic as Alim Rasali. He was someone that had a message that he felt should be brought to the entire world. Sayyid Muhammad Husseini al-Shirazi was someone who believed that Islam is not just something which encompasses the very basics of jurisprudence, our, our relationship with Allah Azza wa He was someone who believed that Islam encompassed our relationship with others in society. He's someone that believed that the message of the Ahl al-Bayt could be imposed, could be used to deal with everything that we encounter in our lives. Not someone who decided to reduce the Ahl al-Bayt and their role to one of merely, well, this is the time for religion and this is the time for the rest of my life and I'm going to be secular. No, Sayyid al-Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi was someone who placed a great emphasis on the impact of the teachings of Yahl al-Bayt. When we refer back to some of his other works, we can see he was a great scholar who was particularly well read, not only in the tra traditional classical Islamic sciences, but also well read in general. What do I mean by this? When we look at books such as Falsafat al tuarikh the philosophy of history, we see that Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi was someone who was well engaged with the Western philosophical tradition. Do I mean solely the Western philosophical tradition, which can be isolated to the time of the deviated Greek philosophers such as Aristotle, Plato and Socrates? No, absolutely not. Muhammad al-Shirazi, may God have mercy upon his soul, and may he reward him for the great works he has done, was someone who was familiar with even contemporary Western philosophy, dialectical philosophy, Marxist philosophy. And in fact, one finds in his book, The Philosophy of History, that he engages with many of these views. He engages with the views of these secular Western historians and philosophers in order to refute them and demonstrate that no, Islam, or the Qur'an and the Rawayat of the Ahl al-Bayt, but more particularly the Qur'an, give us a specific insight into what Allah Azza wa Jal would be giving us as the accurate philosophy of history. Is there a philosophy of history? And indeed, if there is, can we find it within the scriptures? Now, of course, there are people out there who would believe that no, unfortunately, the Ahl al-Bayt only came to give us religious injunctions. They only came to give us injunctions particularly pertaining to worship. They were people who gave us solely injunctions pertaining to worship, rituals, and dealings with others. No. Muhammad al-Shirazi argues that indeed the Quran, as the word of Allah azawajal, as that which describes itself as an explication for everything, would naturally include details of a philosophy of history. And that's why when you refer back to such a work, you can find in detail the engagements of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi with these Western philosophers, responding to them using ayat of the Qur'an, using verses of the Qur'an, which other scholars, other mufassirin, when they engaged with them, believed that they were restricted to solely one context, a context of giving us laws, a context of giving us stories and parables. They did not derive a general trend from these stories in the same way that Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi has done. You find that the oppression of Sayyid Muhammad al-Husseini al-Shirazi has continued and perpetuated even after the great Alim's death, which occurred in the month of December in the year 2001, according to the Gregorian calendar. Unfortunately, there are those in the world who, due to a rather simplistic view, believe that Muhammad al-Shirazi was someone who was concerned with things that bring the Muslims, and particularly the Shia, backwards. Allow me to engage with, unfortunately, 
this disgusting slanderous effect which has come from particular groups wishing to be mean and belittle this great personality. We find that Muhammad al-Shirazi, contrary to what is claimed by his opponents, opponents who have never read a book of his in their life, is not someone who considered himself to be dealing with solely issues such as the Husseini rituals. Yes, the Husseini rituals, according to Muhammad al-Shirazi, were of the great and utmost importance to the religion of Islam. No alim would deny this, for certainly Sayyid al-Shuhada was the very embodiment of Islam, someone who sacrificed his life in order that this religion would preserve. And through his revolution, it is thanks to it that we are today Shia and we even have heard of the Quran, have heard of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa have heard of the Ahlul Bayt. But one finds that there are some people who wish to so should we, we could say, restrict the message of Imam Muhammad Shirazi to being one solely of dealing and promoting with the Husseini rituals. One who reads the books of Muhammad al-Shirazi, one who even reads a list of the books of Muhammad al-Shirazi, a list of the names, titles, offered by Imam, Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi would know that this is a great slander and that the Sayyids worked on writing many more books on things other than the Husseini rituals and indeed was busy trying to promote the idea of a global state under the name of the Ahl al-Bayt, a global state with no borders in which the Muslims would have self-determination and be able to combat enemies such as the Zionist entity. Dear viewers, you've been listening to somewhat of a glimpse of the life of the great Alim Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, the author of the work we will be going through, namely from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam. Inshallah ta'ala after the break, we will continue with going through some of the details surrounding the life of the great Alim Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi. Inshallah ta'ala you'll join me all after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Shirazi was the religious authority merge to millions of Shia Muslims around the globe. A charismatic leader who is known for his high moral values, modesty and spirituality. He is a mentor and source of aspiration to the millions and the means of access to authentic knowledge and teachings of Islam. He has made extensive contributions in fields of learning ranging from jurisprudence and theology to politics, economics, law and sociology. Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, Iraq in 1374 after Hijra, 1927 AD. He belongs to a distinguished family deeply rooted in Islamic science, literature and virtue. His followers are found in many countries in the global. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi was distinguished for his intellectual ability and holistic vision. He was recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concern to mankind. He has written various specialized studies that are concerned to be among the most important references in the Islamic sciences of beliefs and doctrine, ethics, politics, economics, sociology, law, human rights, etc. He has enriched the world with his staggering contributions of some 1300 books, treaties, and studies on various branches of learning. His works range from simple introductory books for the young generations to literary and scientific masterpieces. Deeply rooted in the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Islam, his visions and theories covers areas as politics, economics, government, management, sociology, theology, philosophy, history and Islamic law. His work on Islamic jurisprudence, for example, constitutes 150 volumes which run into more than 55,000 pages. Through his original thoughts and ideas, he has championed the causes of issues such as the family, human rights, freedom of expression, political pluralism, non-violence, and shura or consultative system of leadership. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi believes in the fundamental and elementary nature of freedom in mankind. He calls for freedom of expressions 
political plurality, debate and discussion, tolerance and forgiveness. He strongly believes in the consultative system of leadership and calls for the establishment of the Leadership Council of Religious Authorities. He calls for the establishment of the universal Islamic government to encompass all the Muslim countries. Dear viewers, thank you for enduring with that short break. Now let us return to analyzing the great life of the author of a work from the laws of Zahra, namely the great Ayatollah al uthma Imam Muhammad ibn Mahdi al husseini Shirazi. As I had mentioned prior to the break, this oppression done to the personality of the great Imam is one which has continued and persisted even after the great Alim's passing away. And it is with great unfortune that such a persecution, such a critique has been leveled against his great and blessed personality. Allow me to engage with some more of these critiques in order that we might understand the life of this great alim and whenever you hear someone tell you some of these critiques question why is it that he wishes to say these things why is it that he is speaking of a great alim in such a way and indeed we all seek refuge with Allah Azza from speaking against the great ulama and I take this advice upon myself before anyone else. We seek refuge with the fitna that exists amongst our community. Indeed, we see that we live in a time in which the Shia of Iraq, the Shia of Pakistan are being slaughtered irregardless of who they are maqallideen of. And yet we find that the Shia themselves are busying themselves with saying he's a maqallid of X, he's a maqallid of Y, he follows this train of thought and he follows that train of thought. Dear viewers, we pray that Allah Azawajal saves us from such deviation and such a derivation from the true teachings of Islam. Back to the slander which is leveled against the personality of the great Sayyid we find that some people try and claim that the Sayyid was busying himself with sowing the seeds of disunity amongst the Muslims as opposed to dealing and tackling the main enemy of the time, namely the Zionist entity. Such could not be further from the truth. When one returns back to the books of the Sayyid, one finds that the Sayyid was extremely emphatic, was extremely placing a lot of detail on refuting the Zionist entity, on refuting the existence of Israel and placing an emphasis on combating such an opponent to the Shia. We find that the Sayyid was someone who talked constantly about the need for Muslims to unite. Of course, the Sayyid, like all other great scholars of Islamic sciences, was someone who placed an emphasis on unity built and based upon the correct foundations. A unity which involved us returning back to the message of the Quran and indeed the message of the Ahlul Bayt. The Sayyid was no apologist in that regard. And indeed, when one returns back to the book, from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam, the Sayyid demonstrates such a position using the very speech of Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra herself. But is it fair to say that the Sayyid was by any means this takfiri that is made out was someone who derived the real intention of and focus of the Muslims from the real outer enemy towards focusing on an inner enemy. No, this is by no means correct. And for those who wish to read further into the approach of the Sayyid in regards to sectarianism, they can 
refer back to his booklet, Salahuddin al Ayyubi. May God separate him from his mercy, the great tyrant. The title of the book is called Salahuddin al Ayyubi and the Problem of Sectarianism, in which the Sayyid deals specifically with the issue of sectarianism and how it is an issue which has plagued the Muslim world and what the solutions to this are and how we should distance ourselves from certain historical personalities. In regards to other works of the Sayyid, I myself was an individual who had not heard of the great Sayyid until I relocated to London, the capital of the UK. Indeed, I am originally from Scotland, and whilst I was in Scotland, one of my friends who I met via some mutual contacts after reverting to the true faith, or converting to the true faith as I prefer to say, introduced me to the office of the Sayyid, um, and indeed one of the Scottish converts was a prominent translator of the works of the Sayyid. Through coming to read these works, they served as the basic introductory collection of books which I used to derive my basic knowledge of Islam. Many of the books of the Sayyid have been translated into the English language. Books such as the Quran, when and how was it compiled? Books as, such as the family. All these books are very useful introductions to the faith. Useful introductions at refuting common polemics leveled against the belief of the true teachings of Islam, namely the Shia, leveled against us by others who claim to be following the religion of Islam. And if only these books would be paid attention more, if only these books would be paid more attention to, we would find that the Muslim Ummah would be in a much better situation. Today, the media has a focus on the religion of Islam. Today, when the media talks about Islam, what do you expect them to think? The main voices of Islam, the main proponents of Islam, according to the view of the media, and I don't deny that there clearly is a media agenda at times to present Muslims in a negative light. But who are the more vocal voices of Islam in the world today? We look at the media and we see that the focus is now placed on revivalist Wahhabi groups such as ISIS or ISIL as it's occasionally known, a group spreading its filth and vile corruption in the blessed nation of Iraq. Such a group claims to be speaking in the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi claims to be speaking in the name of the religion of Islam, claims to be speaking in the name of the Qur'an. Yet we find that such people take the verses of the Qur'an and the teachings of Rasulullah out of context in addition to spreading fabricated teachings attributed to the Messenger of Allah. May peace and blessings be upon him and his holy family. When we turn back to the books of Imam Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, we find that he had placed an emphasis on countering such a movement. He had placed an emphasis on countering the propaganda which had spread to the West of Islam. How? He did so through writing books, books which brought the true message of Islam. Now indeed, that's a very generic thing for me to say. Every alim writes books, and particularly if he follows the true Mafhab of Islam, if he follows the true path of Islam, the Ahlul Bayt, then inshallah he is also writing books which bring the truth of Islam to other people. But when we look at the revolutionary spirit of Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi, we find he was writing books such as Islam, Peace and Nonviolence, emphasizing that Islam is not intrinsically a violent religion, emphasizing that the main aim of the religion of Islam is peace. Indeed, the Sayyid in such books places an emphasis on the need to spread peace and how Islam under no circumstances justifies violence except in retaliation, in defense. That's why the Sayyid in his Mosu'at of Fiqh in the book of Jihad proves that the Jihad, the wars of a messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were all defensive our Prophet was not this vile 
warmongering individual, as is claimed by those speaking in the name of a messenger of Allah, those deviated groups who are killing every community here in Iraq under the name of Islam. We find that through such works, the Sayyids had emphasized a return to the true Islam, the Islam of the Ahl al-Bayt. And more importantly, through doing such, we find that the Sayyid was continuing the mission of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam. And of course, I don't mean to liken the Sayyid to a Masoom. I don't mean to liken the Sayyid to an infallible, for indeed, none can be compared with Ali Muhammad, as the Ruayat say. But, Let's compare the focus of the book Munfiq al-Zahra, what it is studying, to the work of the great saint. The work Munfiq al-Zahra is a work analyzing two narrated, one could say documents, but two narrated narrations or parts of speech on the authority of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Namely, the famous hadith al-Kisa, the hadith or the narration of the cloak as is narrated by Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam to Jabir. A narration which Sayyid Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi himself narrated directly from his own chain of authorities all the way back to Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. And indeed the great khutbah of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra in which she refutes the claims of those speaking in the name of Islam. It is in this the khutbah of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, which we will be analyzing inshallah ta'ala in a few episodes from the Sayyid's work, from the laws of Zahra, in which Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam challenges a deviated claimant to authority. She challenges this authority using the Quran and the narrations and proves as the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, that such people are a deviated sect a deviated, corrupt group of militants speaking in the name of Islam, attributing things in the name of Rasulullah in which they have no authority to speak. Likewise, the Sayyid in writing such works was challenging the authority of a modern day Saqifah party. People such as ISIS, people speaking in the name of Islam with no authority. I pray dear viewers, that you benefited from this short introduction to the lifetime of Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi, rahmatullah alayhi. And I would pray that you all investigate more into this great scholar's life, and more importantly, those who are familiar with him and have benefited from his works. I pray that we all recite a fatiha upon his blessed soul. And I pray that you will join me for the next episode in which we will continue by analyzing the personality of Sayyid Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.